Hi everyone, um, my name is Wednesday and I am the UMSS President for 2020. Um, so to kick off our How to Post Grad Seminar Night, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the event, um, how it's going to run, and then we can start with our speakers. Um, so How to Post Grad started in 2018 and it's our annual event where we have a whole bunch of students um, from the University of Auckland or who have been studying at the University of Auckland um, basically come and tell us all about their research and the kind of stuff that they've done and how they've got to where they are now, which is really exciting. Um, yeah, so tonight our first speaker will be Celia and then we will have Jess, Jay and then Veronica. Um, so feel free to ask them any questions that you have about their research. Um, after each talk, there'll be a little bit of time for questions. Um, so you can either ask them in the chat um, or I might <laughs> unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, either is totally fine. And then if you have any extra questions, we can um, give you email addresses and all that sort of thing. So yeah, go ahead, Celia. Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to figure out how to share my screen. So wait, can anyone see that? Uh, just do a thumbs up, Wednesday. Yep. Yeah, we're all cool. good. All right, so this is my presentation. It's a battle of the sea urchins. It's kind of a bit about my masters and stuff. So a bit about me. I'm Celia Blamey. I was born in Auckland, uh, but we moved around a lot as a kid because of my dad's job. So I spent some time in Fiji and the Solomon Islands, which was really cool, which I think is one of the reasons that I have always wanted to do marine biology because in Fiji we lived like literally across the road. So we used to go snorkeling every day after school. Um, yeah, so that was really cool. That was just something fun to do. So I did my undergrad at the University of Auckland. So I flew up from, came from Nelson to Auckland and did a Bachelor of Science in Marine and Environmental Science. And then I did a PG dip afterwards. I got to the end of my undergrad and kind of decided that I wanted to keep studying and also knew that I kind of wanted to do research-based stuff and a master's is kind of minimum of what you can do. The PG dip was a very interesting year. I don't know if some of you guys are doing it at the moment, but it was really hard, but it was also really awesome because you do like a lot more critical thinking. You get to know your lecturers a lot more. It's a lot more, you don't have as many lectures and stuff. So it was a lot more react, uh, relaxed, sorry. And then, so my master's research is my actual research title is Our Centrosephanus Rodrizi Increasing in Northern New Zealand on Northern New Zealand Reefs and What Ecological Impacts Do They Have? So centros are the black uh, sea urchins you can see on your screen at the moment. And the other ones are kinna. Um, so we're comparing Centrosephanus to kinna and my supervisors are Nick Shears and Richard Taylor. Uh, so Centrosephanus are actually an endemic species so they've always been here but it's looking like the population's increasing, uh, which could potentially be a problem. Because as you have probably heard of, kinnabarans are a massive, massive issue in um, New Zealand due to overfishing mainly. Um, but it's interesting to they also eat sesame on vertebrates and stuff, like on the like, walls and in the caves and stuff, at, like the pool nights and the mokohinos. So they can potentially have a greater impact because kinna tend to uh, tend to um, just focus more on seaweed. So as you can see in the bot in the graph here, it's uh, over the last 25 years, kind of gives you an indication of the increase of the species. So they have increased quite a lot. This is just kind of some preliminary data at the Mokes and the Paul Knights. And the other image is from the uh, Tasmania. So because of climate change, the tropical gyres are all speeding up and the on the east coast there's this big current that runs down the side of Australia and it's extended further down into um, Tasmania bringing uh, lots of these centrosephanous um, larvae so they've ended up with like hundreds of kilometres of barrens so that could potentially happen here and we're kind of seeing a little bit of a shift from Canabarans to centrosephanous barrens in certain areas. So what I'm currently up to, we have done some diving out at the Mokohinas, which was really cool. And I'm kind of running some experience, experiments at the moment. So this is 
my urchin rave. I've got a couple of these at the Lee Lab. Um, but they're just like an artificial habitat that we've set up with uh, some rocks and stuff in the bottom of them. And there's five cinch stiffness and five kinna, maybe a few more, in each one. So we can kind of study and look at the different interactions between the two species. And they've got red lights so that we can watch them overnight because they kind of are most active at dusk and dawn. I also ran some feeding experiments. So we tested Stephanus ate more like sponges and bryozoans and acidians more so than seaweed than can I do. Um, yeah, and from the data, it definitely looks like there was a bit of a trend. So they, yeah, they ate more of the sponges and acidians. And yeah, so that's, I've had lots of tanks down the bottom tank room, which is currently being renovated. But so I had, yeah, 10 cent stiffness, 10 kinna, and then 10 controls. And it was a lot of measuring out little prey species. And then I'm also doing some stable isotope analysis. So you look at the carbon and nitrogen isotopes and they kind of give you an indication of uh, like the trophic level and what they've been feeding on. So I've currently been just processing those at the moment. And then we're also doing some gut analysis just to see what they've been eating overall. So we've been looking to see if there is a difference between habitat. So we've got kelp forest uh, barrens and also walls so we have taken both species from these three habitats and they're being compared. Uh, so my advice for marine science, if you're gonna, th if you're thinking about doing postgrad, is you have to be really passionate about it. Postgrad's not particularly a walk in, a par in the park and it's not, uh, like there's not as much hand holding and stuff as there, has, there is in undergrad sometimes. Uh, when you're looking for like a master's or uh, like a thesis project, I would focus more on like the skills that you're wanting to gain, not necessarily like a particular species, because obviously everyone wants to work with dolphins because they're so cool, but not everyone can. <laughs> so like for me, I knew that I wanted to do diving and doing like a lot of field work, which some of us been canceled because of COVID, but that's okay. And like lab work. So that's why I chose my, my particular thesis. And also I would get to know lots of the different supervisors and kind of figure out how you, who you click with best as well. So I pretty much like emailed everyone that did kind of any, anything marine science based and was like, hey, um, think about doing masters, what kind of options have you guys got? And, and yeah, I just said, and Richard, uh, try to find some internships. I know that the Council and the Crown Research Institutes have like summer internships, which can always be a good way to gain some I'd like job experience and also skills that you might potentially use in your postgrad. And then lastly, just have fun because it's it can, it's so awesome and it's like so exciting to be actually able to study, be able to study something you're really passionate about. And that's kind of the whole point of it. Cool. Thank you. Uh, has anyone got any questions? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it sounds like it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Celia. That was really cool. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat or unmute yourself. I have a question for you. Um, yep. What recommendations do you have for people that want to scuba dive for their masters? Are there any requirements or anything that you need to do that sort of stuff? Yeah. Yep. So you have to have your rescue diver. You also have to have your like being able to administer oxygen, which you can do through PADI. So I did mine the same time, did my rescue course. You have to have a dive medical and you kind of need to have your own gear. Yeah, you can't, you do. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so that's kind of the main things. And also have a few dives kind of under your belt because yeah, they do like a big checkout dive and it pays to have some experience. And also when scientific diving is so much different to just like going to have a look at stuff because you've got to carry all the equipment and it's really heavy <laughs> and it changes your buoyancy but yeah it's cool so awesome cool great it doesn't seem like there are any questions but that's okay if you do um end up having a question feel free to post it in the chat and um, Celia can answer it for you at another time.
Yeah, um, and also if you've ever got any questions, just feel free to email me or message me on Facebook or anything. Cool. All righty. Shall we get into the next speaker? I believe that is. Oh, uh, actually, Celia, before you um, pop off, there is a question for you. Um, besides COVID, what has been something that has surprised you about doing a research thesis? Uh, probably one of the main things is like realizing actually how much I love doing research. So I enjoyed undergrad and, and post like and PG dip, but this has been so rewarding. It's kind of cool running your own stuff. And like, I realized that I like, love being in the field and I love doing like scientific diving. So that's probably been the biggest thing. And like urchins don't actually sound that interesting, but they kind of can be, cause they can potentially have some really big impacts, which is kind of cool. And it's, you get to kind of more in depth look at stuff, if that makes any sense. Yeah, so it's really cool. Awesome. Cool, shall we move on to Jay? All right, all right. Um, is this volume good for everyone? Microphone works okay? All right, um, let me just share my screen and we can get going. <clears throat> cool. All righty, um, so hi everyone. My name is Jay or Jay Vera Santos. I'm a master's student at the AUT lab for cephalopod ecology and systematics, otherwise known as ALCES at AUT. I'm supervised by Kat Molstead and head of project at AUT, and also Mandy Reed from AMRI, the Australian Museum Research Institute. Um, I'll talk about my project shortly, but it was done with support from Auckland War Memorial Museum, Niwa, and also Te Papa. Um, my big message today isn't going to be about the squiddy stuff that I do a lot. It's more about how to go about making decisions around post -price. So make it about you. Alrighty, let's get going. Now, first up, why even consider my advice, right? Like why, why am I speaking today? Um, the big thing is I consider myself lucky in two different ways. Um, the first way is number one, I'm submitting my thesis in a few weeks and I've had a job lined up since May, um, a measure of success for some people, but I would like to have a little humble brag about that. That's something I'm really, really proud of. And that's because of the steps that I've taken throughout uh, my postgrad. And number two, the most important thing, I loved postgrad, right? Um, the biggest thing is that, not that saying that you love postgrad is rare, like you heard from Celia, like it's a pretty good um, experience. But there are also some groups of people that don't get to say that about their postgrad experience, right? And the advice and the stuff I want to talk to you guys about today is more about helping you get into the group that gets to say this at the end of postgrad, if that's what you choose to do. Um, it's not just something that you kind of sit back and let happen to you. It's not something that you just tick off a list. Um, this is something that you really got to invest in and, and really, really think about how you want to get the most out of it. Um, so here we go. Here's my journey. Um, you can see there's a big gap there, 2010 to 2020. I try to get through it as much as, as, as fast as I can. But the, the reason I want to talk about this is because I'm not like a student that's done your bachelor's, jumped into PG Dip, did master's, and here I am, success, yay. Um, I screwed up so many times. So let's see how I screwed up. Um, just for a background, I'm Filipino. I was raised in an Asian household. And a lot of Asian culture centers around, you know, success is making a lot of money. Success is having a high paying job. Success is taking care of your parents when they're older. And that was why I focused on starting on the Bachelor of Science in Comp Sci. It's not something that I enjoyed, but it was something I was capable of and thought, hey, at the end of this, I'll be employable and I'll make a decent salary. Parents will be happy, I can take care of them. And so going through this kind of, um, mindset. I went through B-Sci and Comp-Sci, decided to, heck, let's do more work. Chuck in some dip language of Korean in there. Let's do even more work. Let's double major with emphasis. Let's chuck in even more work. <laughs> let's do a conjoint. So I did B-Sci, B-Comp-Sci emphasis, and that was, this is about three or four years in at this point. 
And at this point, I realized, um, oh no, there's the big sad. This is my mental breakdown. At this point, I realized if I'm not happy doing what I'm doing now in uni, um, there's no way I can succeed in the working world against all of these colleagues of mine that actually love what they do and are succeeding in uni, right? I can't last decades if I can't last years just now. Um, so I had a big mental breakdown, told my parents, you know what, I'm not going to do any of this anymore. I'm going to do what's good for me. I like marine science. I'm going to drop everything and start over from there. And here we go. Starting to think about me for once, B side, marine side. And the funny thing is once my grades started picking up, my parents moved from being disappointed to being a bit more supportive where I told them, you know, I'm sorry that I'm not pursuing something that will make you happy. And I'm pursuing something that might be more difficult for everyone in the long run. And my dad said to me, hey, it's okay. You realize that marine scientists can make money too. And that sounds really funny, um, but to me, that was a big shock because in my head, it was like, do stuff that makes my parents happy, make a lot of money, but be sad, or do what I want to do and live in poverty. Not the case. Uh, marine scientists do make money too. So if you do a good job, you can, you can make something out of it. Um, and then at the end of it, I ended up getting my comms I major back in there anyway, because I had those credits. After six and a half years of undergrad, I decided I'm going to take some time off. I did a year of teaching English in Korea, came back into my PG Dip in Marine Science, and up until this point, everything has been at Auckland University. After PG Dip, I moved to AUT to do my master's in applied ecology. And here I am now. In a couple of weeks, I'll be starting employment at the Australian Museum over in Sydney. So, long timeline, but just to show you that things can twist and turn and things can still be okay. So um, that's the journey there. Um, just for context, in this red area here, this is 2016. This is when I first made contact with my supervisor. I knew that I wanted to work with squids. I just loved them so much. How can I get involved? And also I started contacting people about volunteering. So I contacted the Auckland War Memorial Museum and asked them, hey, is there a chance for me to volunteer with you guys? Throughout the year in Korea, I maintained contact. And only when I got back in 2018 did I select my project and start volunteering. So these things can take time, but if you take time and think about things carefully, um, you can get some really, really good results. So don't rush through things. Um, here's why I love post-grad, okay? Number one, I got value and control. So value and control for me was like, I was looking at post-grad, what kind of skills and knowledge do I want to get out of this? And I knew that I wanted to end up at AUT working with squids, so I backtracked from there. What about the courses? How am I going to do those? And looking at AUT's courses, for me personally, um, they didn't really line up with what I wanted to do. There was a lot of general ecology stuff, a lot of terrestrial sciences, and that might be good for others, but I wanted like pure like marine science. So that's why I chose Auckland Uni, did my courses there, and then switched over. That's totally possible. Number two, I found supervisors that suit me, right? Um, a lot of people can tell you that the supervisors that you get for masters are make or break for you. Um, and that is extremely the case. You've got to find the right supervisor that will help you flourish, right? The right amount of push versus freedom and also consideration for your mental health too. It's a very, very stressful time. And that's exactly what I got. So I'm, I'm really lucky with the supervisor that I have. Um, sometimes you can think to yourself, oh, I'll just find a famous supervisor. Doesn't matter how they treat me. I can stand one or two years of not exactly flourishing and then I'll get out of it. Um, but that's kind of sad because this should be a highlight of your academic career, like you're choosing your project and spending a whole year dedicated to it. And also one or two years spent not flourishing means that all your colleagues around you that are competing for jobs might be. So think about that. And number three, I said the project I was able to obsess over and be proud of. I love my project. Um, because I had been in contact with my supervisor for such a long time, we got to know each other a little bit better. And when she suggested the project for me, that's the one that she picked out for me after knowing me. So it got, uh, took a long time of consideration and I'm, I'm happy with it. And number four, I had the support to explore the applications of my study. Um, the marine science community in the world is quite small. Uh, here in New Zealand and Australia, it's even smaller, right? So everybody knows everybody. Um, with my volunteering and all my contacts that I had everywhere, I found the right network of people. And, you know, that's how I was able to get the job. Someone knew of a vacancy, knew of someone, emailed someone else, came to my supervisor, and then came to me. That's how things work, and, and not just marine side, but every career path, right? It's all about your networks. So my advice for you guys, if you're considering post-grad or whatever stage you're at, 
number one is um, be ready to commit. Um, it's two years of your time, but once you start, things can move quite quickly. You kind of have to jump at every opportunity that comes your way. You don't really have time to sit back and be like, give me a couple of months to figure out my life and then I'll get back to you. Often cases, it's a quick yes or no, do you want to commit? Um, so think about that. You gotta make sure your mental health is in check because um, it can be quite rough going through one or two years of postgrad. Um, and also think about yourself, right? Make it about you. What do you want? Um, once you're done with your undergrad, do you want to work first? Do you want to take a bit of time off and think about things? Do you want that gap year you've been planning for a while, COVID admitting? Or even more than that, do you want this postgrad? Is this something that you want and will be beneficial for you? Or is this something that are, you know, other people are telling you about? Because unless you're sure, you don't want to start off on, on you know, rocky steps, right? You want to be very, very sure before you start. Number two, uh, shop around. Like I said, think about your courses. Um, you don't have to stick to one institution. If there are other bits and things that you want to do elsewhere, look into getting those cross-credited. It's about the skills and knowledge that you get at the end of the day. Um, some people end up coming out of their postgrad and being like, oh crap, I didn't learn anything. That was a waste of time and money. Um, a lot of the time, that can be their fault. Um, you've got to look into what you want to get out of it and then find the courses that work for you, find the right supervisors. Um, I've got two examples for you guys here, two very close friends of mine. One of them is an absolute scholar, A pluses all the time, all through undergrad, got scholarships here and there, and really thrives on pressure. And she found a supervisor that really just cracks the whip, right? High expectations and a lot of intense work. And she flourished in that environment. Got an A plus in her master's thesis, she's good to go. Um, the other end of the spectrum, another friend of mine, equally as bright, equally as talented, but unfortunately went through a lot of emotionally draining stuff in her master's thesis year. But her supervisor um, was very attentive to her mental health needs, um, was there to fight for her extensions every time she needed them, was there to check up on her every day to see how her mental state was doing and what was feasible for their plan going forward in terms of productivity. So you really got to find the balance there and also find the project, right? You want to find the project you love. Um, a big thing is be mindful of the hours outside of academia. Um, it's good to sit around and study and do your essays, but time outside of that is also valuable too. So I suggest that you look into volunteering or upskilling. There's some examples there. Um, it's going to be really, really cool when you find things that you like and don't like. Um, sometimes you'll find something and start volunteering or, or learning it and you'll be like, oh crap, I don't want to do this anymore. That's fine too. At least you've ticked that off the list. You don't want to go down that road ever again. Um, but definitely think about those times outside of the class. People, when they hire you, they want someone that can do more than write essays, right? Um, and the last big thing is you're, you'll be okay. Um, whichever path you take, you'll, you'll be okay. So um, at any point in time, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to change your mind and it's okay to find dead ends. Uh, at the end of the day, all those things play their part in helping you find the right path for you, right? Um, so don't be too hard on yourself. You can take me as an example. Sometimes success can take a decade to find you. <laughs> um, so all the interviews are out of the way. That's, that's all good and done. Um, here's my stuff. Here's all the squiddy stuff. I work on bobtail squids. Um, my project is about finding new species. Basically, we thought we had one species here in New Zealand. Turns out we have two or three. Um, they look like this. Beautiful amazing, enigmatic, colorful. They look like this, wow, so suspicious, so beautiful. And if you go down to the deep sea, sometimes they can look like this too. Also beautiful in its own right. So these guys are amazing, I love them to bits. Um, but my project is working with integrative taxonomy. So that's trying to find new species based on morphology and also genetics, right? Two different tools. Um, so morphology is about how it looks and measurements, all the stuff you can hold in your hand. Um, and that's traditional taxonomy. So um, as beautiful as they are, they come to me looking like this, um, a little bit more phallic than I appreciate, but there you go. They come out <laughs> dead, pale, covered in ethanol, and pretty smelly. So not as beautiful as the photos, but I still, I still love them. Um, there can be many in single jars. So you can see this is new species one for me. The males are on the left, they're smaller, and the females are on the right. All really, really beautiful. I measure everything, right? So here are their arms. I measure the length of their arms, the ratio of their arms, how many suckers, how many rows, the sizes, the size differences. 
the tentacle club, how many rows, the size, how many suckers, internal anatomy, the gills, different bits and pieces, the funnel and reproductive system. Uh, if you don't know, squids have beaks. Uh, I have to look at their beaks as well. Sometimes their different shapes can be indicative of different species. We do SEM, so scanning electron microscopy. You can see this is a SEM of a squid club. You can see bits and pieces of what they look like, even down to the dentition around each individual sucker. Believe it or not, those can also differ between species. So this is a really cool tool that we've got. Here are arm suckers. You can see how they differ along each arm as well, even in one individual. Uh, if you didn't know, squids have tongues, like radula. Um, they're related to snails, so as snails rasp up food and plants as they eat, squids still retain that feature. You can see a row of seven teeth there, and those can be indicative of different species as well. Um, I get to do art. Believe it or not, I have never done art before doing my thesis, but I get to draw stuff like this, which will be retained forever and ever in my thesis and publications for people to look at and laugh at, but I'm really proud of it. It came out looking pretty good to me. And you can see a bit of progress getting to so. Lots of dots, hours and hours of dots, but it's all worth it at the end. As morphology, um, genetics is pretty simple. We get tissue snips from samples that are either frozen or fresh. Um, if they've touched ethanol or been preserved in ethanol, that might be okay, but once they touch formalin, DNA kind of gets destroyed at that point. We do DNA extraction, PCR, so isolate it, amplify it, and send the sequences away for analysis. When the sequences come back, we publish them online and we use trees to determine likely relationships. They kind of look like that at the end of the day. Um, the reason I say likely relationships is because DNA is not the be all and end all of taxonomy. You can't just snip every living thing in the world and make a tree and be like, hey, it's a tree of life. Um, there are lots of loopholes, little bits and pieces that are mistakes that can happen in genetics and it's not 100% foolproof. So morphology and genetics are two really, really vital tools that need to be used together when you're making a new species. Um, they can't live with each other. Equally as important. And just a little bit to finish off me bragging about all the cool stuff I get to do with my volunteering and potential work in museums and collections. That's what a collection looks like. That's one row of wet specimens. You can see jars upon jars upon jars, all in ethanol or formalin, and lots of cool dead stuff in those jars too. It's amazing. There are dry collections too. So for example, boxes and boxes full of just treasures, right? I opened up one box, that's what I saw. Um, the cool thing is with museums, any given museum, about 90% or more of its collections are hidden behind doors that the public don't get to see. So that's why I think I'm incredibly lucky to volunteer and, and work in a place like this. There's all these precious, you know, treasures, this talent that we have in New, in New Zealand that I get to take time and look at and help sort out. Um, for those of you with tryptophobia, I'm really sorry, but here is a coral. Um, beautiful, right? Big, beautiful, and also very fragile. So that's why a lot of these things don't get to make it to public eye. Um, some little crappy friends there. And sometimes you'll stumble upon an entire bucket of squids. This is new species one. There's around 250 individuals in that bucket. So I just want to look at quite a few of those. Very, very lucky me. There's me and my primary supervisor behind me um, with our best faces on. I have a giant squid beak in my hand and a giant squid tentacle in front of me. So I got to meet some celebrities. That's my first giant squid that I worked on as part of Elsie's. I remember that forever. I worked on maybe another one or two giant squids since. So dreams do come true, guys. Just keep at it or find something weird that no one else wants to touch. Um, I'm going to leave it there on my advice screen there in case you want to think about it, or you can just keep reading that final line over and over again if that brings you some joy. Um, but I'll take questions if there's time for them after my rambling. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you, Joe, so much, Joe. That is amazing. <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> um, we do have one question in the chat already, and that is oh. how do you recommend finding volunteering and upskilling opportunities? Uh, that one is kind of tough. I mean, the way that I fell into it was really random. I, I played music and I got hired to play music at a museum event where I met someone who by chance I chatted to, told them I did marine science and then they hooked me up. So these contacts can come out of nowhere, but best if you even just start Googling things around, like think about what you're interested in or what kind of skills you want. And I bet you there's an online class or some institution that'll at least talk to you about how to go forward. I think most of the time you'll find people are too busy or don't have the, the resources to allow volunteers, but at least you'll get to talk to people and figure out a way from there. So I think, think about what you want and Google it as, as much as I can say, sorry. 
Oh, uh, we have another question. And it says, you mentioned during your academic journey that you tried multiple courses, but I'm curious on what got you into marine biology in the first place and how did you know that you would be so passionate about it? Um, I think it was one of those things. I think everyone has a phase in life where they, they go, oh, I want to be a marine biologist when I grow up. And then real life takes over and they stop thinking about it or something. But um, I think it just really stuck with me. I remember reading a lot about deep sea stuff when I was a kid and I thought, like, crap, like, aliens do exist and they're, they're right there in the ocean like why do you need to go find other planets for like everything is in the ocean that's interesting so i think that just stuck with me i, I like the cool stuff cool feel free to um unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question as well Ready. Cool. If there are no other questions, then I guess we can move on to our next speaker, which is Jess. Cool. I'll just <laughs> share my screen. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, my dog may make a guest appearance in the background. It's currently 6.30 and it's the time that she gets really attached to me for whatever reason. She's currently laying down though, so that's good. Uh, there we go. Cool. All right. So, hi guys. My name is Jess, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how I came to realize that I wanted to do a postgrad degree, and then what I did in my undergrad, as well as in between doing my undergrad and postgrad um, to get to my master's. So, about me, I'm not actually a Kiwi. I was born and raised in Seattle, and in 2014, that's when I graduated high school and I went to the University of Oregon for a year. Absolutely hated it, almost failed out of my first year. So if you feel really down, don't worry, I've, I've been there. You don't have to worry about failing your first year. You can always make it up in the, in the long run. So then what happened is I moved back to Seattle and I spent two years at a community college, which is, something you guys don't have down here in New Zealand. It's basically um, a university that only does your first two years of classes. So it gets all of your like general education requirements as well as starts you focusing on the classes that you kind of want to major in. So like your low level 100 bio sci classes, stuff like that. So I spent two years there and I received what's called an, an associates in biology. So that basically meant that I just did all of my first level, first year bio courses. And then while I was working, or while I was studying at the Highland Community College, I worked at this place called the MAST Center, which stands for Marine and Science Technology Center. And that's it in the picture. It's, um, it was a teaching aquarium associated with the school and that's the aquarium out on the dock over here. It was a very small aquarium. I only worked there for about a year and a half, two years. And essentially I was a glorified plumber. I would work on the manifolds that supplied the salt water from the ocean into the, into the tanks. There were about 15 tanks and I had to clean them regularly. Um, it wasn't like a very exciting aquarium. We had mainly just fish around Puget Sound, which is the bay that Seattle sits on, as well as other invertebrates like sea stars and urchins. And we did have um, an octopus and that was pretty cool. So there's some pictures from that. While I was there, I did get to do some pretty cool things. One of my jobs was playing and feeding with the octopus. So that's the giant Pacific octopus. Her name was Salish and she's not very big there. They caught her when she was six months. Um, this is the mast center inside and some of the pretty cool things that I did get to do which started me thinking about really getting into marine biology was I got to dissect a bunch of um, stranded animals. So this one is um, a humpback whale, a juvenile humpback whale that um, washed up just south of the aquarium and so we took it to a farm and we just dissected it to see why it died. Turned out there was a bunch of worms in its stomach so it wasn't getting any nutrients which is pretty strange. And yeah, so that's what I did in my undergrad that basically kind of propelled me forward through going into marine science. Um, in 
2016, I had an off quarter. We do quarters in the States and I didn't have anything to do. So my mom suggested I come down and study abroad at Otago because one of her good friends is a professor in the business school there. So I decided I would go see him and study abroad. And I actually really liked it. And I decided to just permanently move here. I didn't really want to go back home. So I moved here permanently in 2016 and started in semester two. And I decided I wanted to major in ecology. There wasn't really like a bio biology major at Otago. So ecology was the next best thing. So I did that. So when I really decided what to do for my post, when I wanted to go to postgrad was during my final year, we had like a big project for my e-call, my final e-call class. Um, and we had to go out and just do any project that we could kind of do within the time span of like three to four days. We went out to the Catlins and did that. So what I chose was does heat affect the sand hopper jump height? And I thought the answer is probably my results were a little inconclusive because we only had four days to do everything. So it's not really all that accurate, but probably. Um, but I found doing my own research and trying to think of a question, trying to think of what, what methods are the most effective and then doing all the statistics and actually doing research was super, super interesting. So that's when I was like, yep. Yeah, Postgrad is exactly what I want to do. I need to kind of get these skills to actually do this in the real world. So this is cool. How I did this was um, I created like a jump cage. So each of these little um, numbers is their height in centimeters, and we used a slow mo camera <laughs> and it's really like jumpy. jumped. You can kind of see them jump over here, which is very exciting. And apparently they still talk about it to this day. So I'm very proud of my little sand hopper Olympics that I created. So yeah, that was pretty fun. <laughs> there we go. So then after my um, undergrad, I graduated in June of 2018. And I took about eight months off of school to really gain some more real world experience and apply to master's programs. I wasn't sure if I wanted to stay in New Zealand, or if I wanted to go back to the States and do some master's programs there. So I just decided to take some time off. So what I did in between that time, I worked aboard um, some cruise ships. I was the onboard naturalist for Holland America. I spent one summer there. I was on the New Amsterdam. Um, we sailed from Vancouver to Alaska. It was a seven day cruise with two days at sea. So what I did was I led the onboard seminars a couple of days a week. There were seminars on what kind of wildlife you find in Alaska. Um, like what kind of trees there are. People are very interested in that and um, why this wildlife is really important to Southeast Alaska. And then I also led some onboard whale, it was really whale whale and dolphin watching. Um, when, during our days at sea, we'd just go out and, and try to find anything we were sailing past really. So I, here's the route if you don't really know the United States all that well. We started in Vancouver and then moved up to Southeast Alaska in, in this kind of area. So it was it was a pretty long journey, but it was really fun. Got to do some pretty cool things, saw a lot of really interesting animals like orcas and humpback whales, a bunch of sea otters. Um, and it was really fun. Just, I really learned how to teach people in that because they're just people who come on vacation. They don't really know anything about what's happening out in the wild. So it was just really interesting. Also, it was like a free vacation for me. I really only worked like one hour um, a day. So then I got to go out and do the cruise supplied me with free like excursions. So I got to go bear watching and like kayaking. And this is like, there's this really interesting sport in Alaska called like ax throwing lumberjack games. And that was very fun to go watch them. Um, yeah, so then I, after my summer in Alaska, I was a research intern at the Pacific Whale Foundation based in Maui in the Hawaiian Islands. And I worked there for around four to five months. And this is kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. I worked like out in the public and teaching the public. And this was really behind the scenes doing research and data analysis. So my main thing was fin matching and um, fluke matching for whales and dolphins, as well as um, data entry with some field work. 
Um, the program that I was a part of focused on the Hawaiian false killer whale population. There was less than 200, I think, in the waters around Hawaii. So they were trying to get an estimate on the population. So yeah, this is kind of what my day looked like. Um, we would take photos of their fins when we'd go out and do the field work. We'd go out in the field about once a month. Um, but most of my day was spent like this in front of a computer, just matching fins and um, helping and entering data into an Excel spreadsheet and just helping them analyze how many population, like what a population is happening out there. So yeah, um, that was really fun. I feel like I learned a lot about um, what actually goes into field work and also that most of your time is spent in front of a computer. Like you do have data and you do have field work, but I would say like 80% of your time is spent in front of a computer just doing data analysis. So it was during this time that I was thinking about what I wanted to do. I really, really like whales and dolphins. I've always wanted to work with them. My first word, in fact, was whale. Um, I have a whale tattoo. I'm obsessed with them. But whales and dolphins in general is really vague. You can say you want to work with them, but what about them and what do I really want to do with them? And that's when I realized I really actually like acoustics. I love whale songs. I love how dolphins communicate. So I wanted to look for programs that surround acoustic communication. So that's where what led me to the University of Auckland. They, um, up at the Lee Lab, they have a bunch of um, really great acoustics programs going up there. So I did my PG Dipsci in marine science last year, and I spent this time looking for a supervisor. And the advice I would give you for looking for a supervisor is look, as Celia said, look for a program that will give you practical skills. And you can always apply that to the species you want to work with later. So that's where I found um, Craig Radford, who's my supervisor. And he, he told me he's not doing anything with whales or dolphins. And I was like, that's fine. I just really want to learn the basics on how to analyze acoustic data. So he led me to this project about how lobsters produce sounds. And so my project is lobster sound production. Um, I'm looking at how they produce sounds, what induces sound in lobsters, why do they produce them? And so I've got a bunch of experiments set up up at the Lee Lab. And um, thankfully, I haven't really been affected by COVID because I don't actually need to go out diving. All my lobsters are in tanks. So here's some of my, my lobsters. They are my my children, I love them very much. I, I do really love whales and dolphins now, but I've grown so attached to my lobsters. And one of them died recently. It was very tragic. We had to hold a funeral for him. But yeah, so this is me putting a hydrophone into the tank. And then this is my lobster, Iggy. Um, here are the rest of my lobsters. Recently, they've just molted. So they've um, shed their skin. And when they shed their skin, I can't use them. So I've been on hold for six weeks. But still they're they're living a best life and this is pretty much what a day-to-day -day life looks like for me i'm sitting in front of a computer counting rasps and analyzing the rasp sound that's the sound that the lobsters make so yeah that's kind of how oh if anyone wants to know what they sound like let's hope this works they sound like this Yeah, so they sound kind of like a paint can, which is pretty interesting. So yeah, that's pretty much how I came to do my master's thesis. So if you guys have any questions, just throw them at me. Cool, we have one question in the chat already. Um, what is the biggest challenge you have come across while doing your master's research thesis? Ooh. Um, I would say the, I would say motivation. I feel like I am really motivated, but at the same time, there is a lot of handholding in undergrad that you don't get in a postgrad world. So you can't really say like, oh, I can just do that later. Um, like I encountered some problems where I was like, oh, I can just do that later. But then I realized who is going to help me do that later. It's just me. So I really have to stay organized and keep that motivation up. I'm the only one doing the project. Cool, we have another question. 
Um, how does environmental research, either academic or otherwise, differ between the United States and New Zealand? Oh, sorry, you kind of cut out there. Yeah, um, okay. um, how does environmental um, research, either academic... Yeah. Um, <laughs> did you need me to repeat it again, or are you able to see the chat now? Lost option. There we go. Um, Okay, so in the United States, I would say when I first started doing my, um, like in 2014, the Obama administration was in, um, at, in the United States. So there was a lot of action towards like promoting, you know, green energy and everyone was really on board with like science and, you know, going forward and trying to like save the world. But now with the current administration, it's all, everything's a fake, everything's hoax. Um, climate change doesn't exist. We don't need to like save our oceans. So I think just the fact that New Zealand actually is active in promoting green initiatives is way different to what it is in the United States at the moment. Um, did I need, did I need any extra qualifications before getting on the cruise job? No, they actually told me I needed no qualifications. They told me they were going to teach me everything I need to know about any of the animals out there. They really wanted somebody who was an excellent public speaker. So if you're a really good public speaker, go for it. I had to actually endure a training session where I learned about the different um, wildlife in Alaska, but I kind of already knew about it just being from the area. Seattle and Alaska kind of have similar wildlife, but I actually did not need any extra qualifications to getting a job on a cruise ship. Cool. I have a question. Um, with your little crayfish, um, how come you can't listen to them after they've molted for a few weeks? So interesting thing about when crayfish molt is they molt their stomachs and what we think makes that rasping noise is the gastric mill, which is like their teeth in their stomachs. And when they molt, they molt their stomachs. So their stomachs are also soft for a good two or three weeks until they harden up fully. That's really cool. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Do we have any more questions? Maybe not. That's all right. If you have any extra questions, you can send them through and we can ask, answer them afterwards. Yeah, Alrighty. Email me if you have any questions about working up at the Lily Lab or anything like that. Please email me. <laughs> Thanks, guys. So our last speaker for tonight is Veronica. So you can start whenever you're ready. Kia ora, guys. Um, I'll just figure out how to share my screen quickly. Here we go. Share. Is that working? Working okay? Yeah, sweet. Yep, you're awesome. good. Oh, wow. What a cool event. Thanks for organizing Wednesday. Um, yeah, so I guess my master's journey has recently finished. I just handed it in last week um, in an incredibly stressful last kind of couple of weeks of mayhem. But hey, we got it in. Um, Make sure you do your table of contents not two hours before it's due because it turns out it's really, really hard to do if you don't have insane old computer skills. Um, so I guess the way my journey to masters um, kicked off in Dunedin in undergrad. Um, I did start off doing health science actually wanted to be a doctor and then realized kind of quickly that I liked animals a little bit more than humans and um, thought that they were pretty wicked. So switched over to zoology and marine science and kind of like went on with that. Didn't do too well in my first couple of years. Turns out drinking beers is pretty fun in Dunedin when you're 17, 18, 19 years old. So you don't have to do super, super well in undergrad, so don't stress too much. Just make sure in your third year that you do okay, pretty well. Um, 
And then from there, I took some time off. So kind of knew that I loved uh, dolphins, particularly Maui's dolphins. Did a little bit of stuff with Liz down there with Maui's dolphins and found a passion for them. And then went and um, spent a couple of summers hiking guiding on the Milford track. Oops, I've zoomed in too much. Um, which, if you guys don't know, Melbourne Track is in Fiordland National Park um, and also did a little bit of hiking guiding on the route burn as well. So that was pretty wicked. You're in like this absolutely pristine environment, meeting people from all around the world. Um, and I think it was talking to so many different people, so many academics, people from all different um, backgrounds that I guess you become more inquisitive about certain things. And um, so what I'd do is I'd spend six months, summers hiking, guiding and saving money um, and then splash all that cash and go traveling for the remainder of the year. Um, so I guess like, I know, did a bunch around the place, but would usually kind of try and um, focus on countries with amazing uh, marine areas and um, actually a lot around Asia, firstly, because <laughs> it's affordable. Um, and secondly, just because of the incredible culture. I loved it and the food, so good. Um, and so like whilst I was traveling, especially around like Philippines and Sri Lanka and all sorts, the issue of plastic pollution was just horrific and just couldn't be ignored. Like you'd see just more plastic bags floating around than turtles and um, yeah, just as gnarly as you guys probably know. And so I guess that kind of um, got me feeling pretty motivated and I was doing a bit of work at the time for Elsie's Our Future, doing um, media, media comms kind of writing stuff and social media for them. Um, so I applied for my masters and at UOA and found out that I got in in India whilst I was in India, which was epic um, and was super, super excited. So yeah, basically um, was interested during the PG dip grad year. Firstly, it was just super epic meeting all these, um, all these new lecturers because obviously I did my undergrad in Dunedin. So meeting all these new people, um, totally different broad spectrum of interests. And then all of my epic friends doing marine science, a couple of them here. Um, and yeah, it was just, it was super cool. And during that year was kind of when I looked into the baseline data on plastic pollution in New Zealand, realized that there was pretty much none um, on microplastics, particularly um, in fish. And I kind of thought, well, um, humans care about what directly affects them. So if you can kind of show how that, if microplastics are contaminating the fish that we eat or um, the microplastics can translocate into the flesh that we eat specifically, um, people might care a little bit. Also the high value of um, commercial fish in New Zealand made it kind of important that we know because um, microplastics are a, um, a sink for toxic chemicals. So persistent organic pollutants, um, all sorts of pesticides, gnarly stuff, mercury in the environment cling on to the structure. So, which means if a fish or an animal consumes it, it um, can leach out, the chemicals can leach out when the interaction with the gut, the gut acids and all the yummy gut stuff. So, um, and that stuff's like carcinogenic to humans, a lot of it. So we kind of need to know it's a little bit important. So my aims, I kind of like designed, I guess, 
the experiment around what I specifically wanted to know, which were our wild fish in New Zealand consuming microplastics. And I chose hoki to look at because they are New Zealand's most commercially valuable fish species. Um, and then my experimental species that I looked at to um, assess like how the plastics affect um, or ingestions of the plastics affect the physiology of the fish. I chose snapper just because of they were what was available. So um, quickly to give you some background, um, my supervisor is Dr. Darren Parsons or Dazza as I like to call him. Um, and he's a bit of a legend. So you need to choose a supervisor who matches your personality. Like Darren's super chill. Um, I don't know if I'm chill, but <laughs> it seems to work pretty well. Um, and we kind of could make fun of each other a lot. So that was great. And he also works with Niwa. So I'll kind of get to this topic a little bit, doing like a collab between Niwa and University of Auckland. But what it did is it provided me with incredible resources and potentially a lot more funding than I would have otherwise, which meant that I could do tank experiments in like 20 tanks um, up in Northland at the Marine um, Research Centre up at Breen Bay. Um, so I had 164 juvenile snapper that I did this experiment on and essentially fed them um, microplastic spiked feed. So the feed was all isometric, it all had the same amount of nutrients in it, but then the plastic feed had like different concentrations of like low and high. Um, and so I was looking at, is microplastics retained in the snapper gut and how does it affect it? And does ingestion affect growth and condition and can it translocate into the flesh that we eat? So it was pretty interesting. It was a 10 week trial and I was super lucky to have just a huge amount of support up there in Northland, like just phenomenal people. It was the best time of my life. And funnily enough, when Darren first said, hey, do you want to go up to Northland, live up, live up there for a bit? I kind of was like, oh, but there are no students there. Um, all my friends are at Lee. Like I was a little bit like gutted almost. And then it just ended up being the best thing that ever happened to me. So you don't know everything. You need to take some opportunities is what we learned there. Um, but hokey, so the results of my hokey um, trial, which was essentially dissecting a bunch of hokey from the Chatham Rise West Coast and Cook Strait, taking out their guts in like a super pristine environment so there's no contaminants, and then digesting them in potassium hydroxide and doing some like bubble thing and this, that, and the other, and um, essentially getting a um, filter paper that you can see on that photo there that has the non-organic contents of the gut in there. And then just looking over it for days and days and hours and hours um, to locate funny looking, bright colored, fibrous looking bits and bobs. And so I found um, plastic. Well, what we think is plastic still needs to go through FTIR which is like objective chemical analysis to confirm it is plastic. But we think we found it in 57 of 60 samples, which is like pretty nuts. So that's one or more piece of plastic. And 90% of those were microfibers from our clothes. So that's going to be the hot new topic is microfibers. Um, unsurprisingly, we found the most in the Cook's J. So if you look here, um, on the right graph, you'll see the number of microplastics per fish um, was on average the most in the Cook Strait, the least on the West Coast and um, mid midway on the Chatham Rise. So we had a pretty small sample size. It was only 20 fish per location. Would have been great to have more, um, but we had to like process all of the Chatham Rise fish in quarantine. Um, and yeah, on the left side, you can see the percentage of fish with one or more piece of microplastic in their gut and excluding the suspect particles. So a lot of fish. 
kind of sucky. Um, so that was really interesting. And I found all sorts of colors, but mainly white, blue, and black, and mainly under one millimeter in size. So then my snapper experiment. Um, so we did like a low treatment, high treatment, and then a marine treatment, which was plastic that was soaked in the most polluted area of the Auckland Harbour for 33 days to accumulate some of those, like a biofilm, as well as some like pollutants from the environment. So it was the marine treatment. And I chose to use polystyrene because it's one of the top five um, plastics found in the marine environment. And then we looked at those things that I had just spoken about earlier. So on the right side here, you can see at the bottom, um, my little buddies in their tank. So there's about eight to nine per tank. And um, yeah, I got really, really attached to them during the experiment. And I refrained from giving any of them names because at the end we had to put them to permanent sleep and it was horrific. Um, but all in the name of science, huh? Um, and then above there, you can see that, um, sep that's, what is it? Singeing the separated plasma from the, um, the blood when I was hoping to look at cortisol levels because I saw an interesting behavioral response. The high plastic treatment fish seemed to be a bit more spastic. So we just wanted to look at stress. So, hey, when funding permits. And then this was just kind of, um, on the left here, the graph is the percentage of fish that retain microplastics in the gut, heaps. And on the right, the number of microplastics that translocated into the muscular tissue, which is observed in excluding suspects. So again, they need to be chemically analyzed, but it still was, we still saw evidence of translocation. Um, so we think that it breaks the um, intestinal epithelium, gets into the circulatory system, and then into muscular tissue. I also saw black livers, which was kind of nuts on the high treatment fish, which um, it's hyperemia of the liver or the blood goes there. And I saw it in um, a bunch of the high treatment fish, like 70%. So... Yeah, really interesting. Not too good, but interesting. And then down here is the histology results. So looking at cross-sections of the GI tract to see how the plastics um, mesh with that, I guess. And on the left here, you can see A is like a perfectly healthy intestinal cross-section and E is a high microplastic cross-section. So here's like the ratio of um, the different treatment groups, but basically a bunch of them got severely damaged, which compromises their ability to absorb nutrients, which will affect growth, reproduction, all that fun stuff. And then on the right is some pretty pictures that show specific effects on at a very small cellular level, like increasing goblet cells and all sorts. Um, and so I guess I kind of did this topic with the purpose of I wanted to provide some baseline data on an issue that I cared about to inform policy. Um, so this is actually just recycled from an, a scholarship uh, application. But um, yeah, so I guess the whole purpose was that New Zealand has an opportunity to be a leader in plastic pollution. It was really cool to see that new um, policy come through the other week about single-use plastics. Super cool. It's a little, it's a little step. There's heaps to do. Um, I guess it's important because we want to protect and preserve the high value of industry, especially when it comes to hockey. Like we export a huge amount of hockey. Um, so it's really important. Food safety as well. Um, what I recommended at the end of my master's was that further, st further studies into this, um, be prioritized because it's kind of important if you're chomping on plastic and toxic chemicals. Um, COVID was an absolute spanner. <laughs> um, yeah, I had to do 
microscope work from our little activity sh shed. We called it the Labtivity Shed. Um, basically, yeah, couldn't finish half the stuff that I wanted to in the lab, and that was fine. So it all became a bit of a funny, long-running joke of spending every day looking down the microscope out the back. Um, we all went a bit mad, but yeah, it's um, yeah, it was good. I guess in terms of postgrad stuff, you do something you care about so you don't get over it. You will get over it. So make sure that you have a good work-life balance. I think that was pretty key for me. Um, just do fun stuff and try and incorporate fun stuff into your, into your thesis, skills that you want to learn, sure. I didn't know that I wanted to do chemical stuff. In fact, I hated chemistry at school, but hey, turned out to be uh, pretty interesting. Yeah, if you are interested in doing something that has little to no data, it's kind of cool to be able to contribute some baseline data. Um, it was awesome partnering with NIWA. If you do have any specific questions about that, let me know. Um, yeah, I guess what the others were saying as well as volunteering for stuff. Yeah, lab work, um, psychoms, write some articles. That's kind of what I did whilst doing my masters. Wrote some article, writ, wrote some articles for newsroom and stuff. Um, do a little lecturing for first year students on plastic at UOA. Um, what else did I do? Us use our future and um, sustainable seas national science challenge. Managed to show me away, show me my way onto the stakeholder panel, which was super cool because you're providing feedback on a whole lot of um, proposals that are coming in for funding around New Zealand, particularly promoting kaitiaki tanga, Maori. Māori. Um, so that's been one of the most incredible things to get involved with. So just say yes to everything. Yeah, as I said, be open to things, um, do all the talks, get really good at, <laughs> try and get good at speaking. Um, choose a cool supervisor who's gonna match you. And don't worry if you're a bit of a dud in undergrad, you can, you'll be sweet. Yeah, and also I think what helped me heaps was taking a breather, taking those two years between um, undergrad and postgrad, just taking a little bit of time. But yeah, if anyone has any questions. Um, I have a question. So I'm uh, doing my master's with Darren next year. So I've signed on to a project with him and Niwa. Um, and yeah, just wondering if you had any specific advice about, um, yeah, being supervised by Darren. Do you have anything that you wish you'd done sooner or yeah? Um, Darren is just a legend. What's your project on? Um, <laughs> so I'm doing morphological snapper subpopulations. Okay, wicked. Yeah, um, so he's just morphology anatomy stuff. Yeah, awesome. He's just like such a such a fantastic guy. Just be proactive. Um, yeah, be proactive. He's he's not going to be on your case all the time like some supervisors are. I think um, from what I've heard, some people are like, shh, shh. so you have to be really um, quite self-motivated, but good call doing it with Newa. Like it's awesome to have that extra support. You can go and do the joint graduate conference. Um, and I'm just thinking advice for, for Darren. Yeah. Yeah. And he's just got a wicked sense of humor. Like it's very enjoyable and he's, he's been fantastic to me. So will you be in Lee or up in Northland? No, so I'm going to be in the CBD. So I'm in the Auckland NIWA office at that oh. lab. Okay, cool. Well, I spent a lot of time there and just get to know everyone and have lunch with everyone and, and yeah, enjoy it. But just hit me up if you've got any more questions. Sweet. Yeah, oh, I was actually going to ask if um, you could, if you were willing, if you could send your thesis proposal in as well, because I'm working on that at the moment. Oh, like nice. the 316 one? Uh, 761, yeah, yeah, yeah. 761. Yeah, sweet. 100%. Yeah. Cool. Cheers. I'll um, get my email to you or something after this. Yeah, just send it to UOA chat or just chat me on Facebook. Yeah, sweet. I can get you guys in touch as well. Um, cool. So we had another question in the chat. 
and that was, what would you say the difference between the Marine Science Department at Auckland and Otago is? I'm just applying to postgrad at both, so I'm interested to know if there are any particular things that are better or worse at either of them. That's an interesting question. Um, I guess it's so hard as well. Like I've got some friends who are, um, did postgrad and are doing postgrad and done, and like absolutely love it. Um, it's interesting. My perspective is probably slightly skewed just because it was a long time ago that I did study there and it was an undergrad and undergrad is so different to postgrad from the sense that you really actually start connecting with your lecturers and things in postgrad and that I think they treat you with a lot more respect <laughs> well yeah respect because they know you want to be there whereas in undergrad it's just a little bit more of um you're kind of there you're showing up or you're not showing up to lectures um if you've got any specific questions regarding specific people, if you're applying to a specific supervisor down there, um, I mean, they've got a fantastic marine science department there. I didn't want to stay in both, I guess, and I wanted to diversify my um, contacts and my experience, I guess. So that's why I ended up up north. But it also depends what you want to study as well. like. Um, say if you wanted to sea lines, you wouldn't be doing that up in Auckland. You know what I mean? So, I just want to pop in and say that their marine science department also just recently went through some serious cutbacks last year. So just be mindful that the website might not reflect what they actually have going on there as well. Oh, I have a question about your fish, actually. Um, <laughs> so you said that sure you have like, a lot of because I can't hear anything. Um, we yeah. can hear you. Um, I'm just going to mute you if that's okay, Veronica. Uh, wait, who's talking? Justine. Um. Sorry. Cool. So my question was, how do you make sure the snapper are getting the same amount of food when you have multiple snapper in each tank? Yeah, that's a good question. You, some things you can't 100% control for because the little snapper have quite interesting personalities. In fact, one of them chomped the other one's eyeballs off and we had all sorts of dynamics. We had fish trying to like, like you... You ask about it, we dealt with it. Um, and so what I did was I fed them 1.5% of their body weight per day, 1% um, in the morning and 0.5% in the afternoon. And so what we did is we tagged all the fish, weighed them at the beginning, um, and then using like a pre-existing snapper growth cur curve, like figured out how much they were going to grow um, over the first five weeks or so. Um, and so the weight of the food provided was specific to each tank, depending on the distribution of weights within that tank. So yeah, it was like quite a lot of work, even just calculating and making the food specific to each tank and then make sure you're feeding them enough. But back to your question specifically of, of how did we get it? Well, you just can't, you don't know really if they're eating the exact same amount um, unless you were feeding them one by one but I guess it's kind of just like you can tank average it and yeah that's cool did you make like a dry pellet of food with plastic in it or was it like a yeah <laughs> <laughs> <Seriously>. <laughs> let me tell you <laughs> the mirrors of developing that microplastic spike feed were phenomenal um I went through like three different plastics to try and make the microplastics in the first place who would have thought it'd be hard to um generate microplastics since they're freaking everywhere um and then i tried the pallet thing grinding pallets adding agar water and then microplastics and measured quant quantities um and then literally would squeeze it out of a squeezy thing snip them and then put them on a drying thing dry them into pallets and then that was so inefficient there's no way i could feed all my fish so i ended up making a wet feed with agar dried pallets water microplastics um putting it in a chiller and then squeezing it into the thing in a syringe oh. 
Awesome. Do we have any more questions? I got one. Um, congrats on handing in, Veronica. Hell yeah. <laughs> I was wondering, um, with the data that we got from your study, how does that compare to data from around the world? Are there other similar experiments going on that we can compare with? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. Um, so the hockey, looking at wild um, populations, it did compare with quantities around the world. In fact, a lot of the quantities were in, it was in higher percentage of incidents in New Zealand hockey than some other places. But for example, the same quantity was found um, off the Great Barrier Reef and then a similar also off Fiji as well. So we're, we're realizing this is a huge issue, but what's interesting about the hockey is it's obviously like 200 to 800 meters deep where they hang out. So like we're finding out that the deep sea is a sink for microplastic, particularly microfibers we found as they biofoul and make their way down. Um, so yeah, it was comparable to a lot of studies. And then in terms of the snapper experiment, some studies have found no effect on growth and condition, but the effects on physiology were very um, specific to the concentration of microplastics provided and the duration of the experiment. So for an experiment that was, you know, nine days, you're not really going to see too much happening. But for those longer term experiments, yeah, they were seeing some effects. Um, my histology results were comparable with a couple of studies, which showed that the GI tract just gets totally compromised and which will have long term effects on growth and condition um, if we'd continued that trial on. Um, yeah, translocation wise, into the fish fillet, which is kind of all anyone's really interested in, um, they have found translocation um, mostly in microplastics under. 80 microns in size. So I had a small distribution of microplastics, which were 50 microns. So I, my distribution was 50 microns to two millimeters. So um, I guess I had a portion that were that small, which allowed them to translocate. But um, they're thinking there's like a few different ways that they can translocate, mainly through breaking that epithelial um, layer of the intestine. Um, and they're thinking that there's a possibility to up to 150 microns may be able to get through, but it's still a little unknown and more needs to be done. Sweet. Thanks. Cool. Do we have any more questions? Alrighty, so if no one has um, any more questions and we will wrap up the evening. Um, so we will be posting the email addresses of the speakers um, onto our Facebook page and the event um, discussion board as well. Um, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a really awesome night. Um, thank you to our speakers for chatting to us. Um, your research sounds amazing and good luck for uh, submitting everything. Veronica, have a good holiday. <laughs> relax, chill, go for a surf. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for joining us. Um, and keep your eyes peeled for more events that will hopefully be happening in the future. Cool. Alrighty, we will end the Thanks so much, guys. See ya. Thanks, see ya.